if we think about what people can do now, right? It, it, we, we kind of talked about being able to measure it and, and that seems somewhat, somewhat difficult at the moment. Um, but if you were concerned about senescent burden or, or even for bone health in general, so what can people do now? Uh, is is Desatne plus Questin available for or for for just regular people? I mean, Carcetin, I know, I mean, you can buy it yeah. from health food stores. Desatinib is a prescription drug which has potential toxicities. Uh, you know, it can affect blood counts and so forth. Uh, so I, at this point, would not recommend using Desatinib. Uh, until we have more evidence about efficacy and long-term safety. I don't personally believe that quercetin on its own, especially without identifying the patients who really might benefit from it, is going to have major efficacy on its own. So for the average the average person, you know, who, unless they're in the context of a clinical trial, I would not go out, recommend going out and starting Dosatinib and Kersetin, or even Facetin, because I just don't think we have uh, evidence, you know, right now for efficacy of Facetin, and even the efficacy of D plus Q. Right now, all we have is a biological signal from our clinical trial that needs to be refined and tested further. What I would recommend is certain things that are available. Uh, so, you know, starting with lifestyle. Um, it's pretty clear that uh, in humans also, uh, moderate exercise reduces senescent cells, that modest caloric restriction reduces senescent cells, um, that other lifestyle things that we already know are good for you, such as not smoking and so forth, is beneficial. Now, beyond those lifestyle measures, there are you know, some potential avenues that especially if you have another disease where you need to take these drugs might be beneficial. So for example, if you have prediabetes or diabetes, there is some evidence that metformin may have an impact on senescent cells. It probably doesn't kill senescent cells, but it's what we would call a xenomorphic. It reduces the secretion of the SAS. So, you know, that would argue that if you have prediabetes, for example, and are you know particularly older, over, over age 70, uh, you might consider metformin both to reduce the progression of the prediabetes to diabetes and potentially to impact your senescent cell burden. Uh, you know, there's there's some evidence that the osteoporosis drug, zoledronic acid, uh, may have benefits on senescent cells and may reduce mortality beyond just reducing fractures. So if you have osteoporosis and are concerned about senescent cells, zoledronic acid might be a reasonable choice based on what we know, because you're primarily treating the osteoporosis, but there is some evidence that that may also reduce your risk of heart attack and cancer and so forth, in part through effects on senescent cells. Now, of course, there's a lot of interest right now in the GLP-1 receptor agonists and whether you know, they have anti-aging effects. And I think the jury is still out on that in terms of the, in my mind, in terms of the true anti-aging effects of those drugs and whether those effects or those benefits of those drugs are mainly through weight loss or whether they have some independent effects as an anti-aging drug. Uh, I think the answer could be either one. But if they do, well, they, they do reduce weight. And so in general, reducing adiposity, reducing fat would reduce senescent cells, we believe. Right, right. Yes. The question is whether they have benefits independent of the weight loss. Are they affecting other pathways that are anti-aging distinct from their effects on weight loss? That's a difficult question to answer. Uh, but, you know, and it's mainly relevant to people who might want to take those drugs who are not overweight, which I think is, you know, so if you're obese and you want to lose weight, the GLP-1 drugs have a great rationale. But if you're not obese and you don't have diabetes or prediabetes, I don't think there's good enough evidence that you take the GLP-1 agonists, uh, uh, you know, for anti-aging, you know, in that situation. Are there any symptoms that would 
imply that you have elevated senescent cells. So, I mean, we did talk about measuring. Yeah, right. we still don't have a good answer on that. But apart from, yeah, are there any symptoms that you could look for? There are no specific symptoms. Uh, I think it's reasonable, although this hasn't really directly been tested using some measures of senescent cell burden and other health span measures. But I think it's plausible that people who have multiple comorbidities, you know, multiple age-related diseases, uh, who have frailty, that you know, a, a significant proportion of those individuals likely have increased senescent cells. But that's speculation. I don't know of any good data testing that. And at the moment, even if you work with a doctor, it's it, you know, th there are no like FDA approved drugs for sen as senolytics, correct? I think the only thing is what I mentioned, there are FDA yeah. approved drugs that are used for other conditions like metformin that may have effects on senescent cells, but there are no FDA approved drugs. I think the other thing you know, I wanna point out is that uh, until we did our clinical trial and really tried to develop some of this idea of personalized medicine, which I, you know others have, uh, suggested also it's not unique to us. But I think the thinking in the field was that there, in general, there was an accumulation of senescent cells with aging and that virtually everybody who got older would have high senescent cells. And I think what our data suggests is that that's not necessarily true. So it adds this new twist that it's really imperative to develop biomarkers for identifying those older individuals who truly have a high senescent cell burden. So one of the things that you did talk about, so I, 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 you, you wrote a paper recently kind of analyzing, looking at reviewing the current status, is kind of the next generation of senolytic cells, uh, senolytic um, products. Is there anything you can say about them? Do, do you know how, how close are these to actually being used? Right. So, you know, right now I personally think that DQ is, you know, not the, the, the best senolytic combination, but it's the best we have right now for further testing because it's shown some efficacy, it's shown safety, and we need to learn more about it. Now, other data may come out, you know, and again, I emphasize, uh, I would really uh, urge the field to have control groups Without a control group, I think it's very difficult to judge efficacy. So I, I look forward to randomized control trials of facetin or other senolytic drugs. Uh, I believe that you know more potent but potentially toxic senolytic drugs may be developed or continuing to be developed for specific local indications. So this would be for specific diseases like I mentioned uh, diabetic macular edema or osteoarthritis in the knee. You know, the early trials with those have shown some signals for efficacy, but, uh, you know, for example, the company that was developing the drug for the eye, you know, recently, uh, you know, uh, uh, restructured and, you know, uh, it, you know, may have kind of ceased to exist because they couldn't prove that their drug was better than, you know, what's currently being used. But that doesn't mean that their study wasn't useful because it did show that these drugs do work in the eye. It's just that they weren't necessarily better than, you know, other approaches that are being used. So as a proof of concept, I think it was, uh, it was valid. So in my mind, there's kind of two different approaches that probably need to be pursued. You know, one is, continued development of new drugs that can be used locally that are highly effective for specific conditions associated with high senescent cells. And, you know, the ones that come to mind are, you know, in the eye, uh, in, you know, in specific joint diseases, there are a number of companies pursuing uh, application to the skin to improve wound healing, for example, or to reduce skin aging. So the, because the skin is so easily accessible and you can minimize the absorption of these drugs and potential systemic toxicities, you know, the skin may be another area where these will be developed. On the other side, 
systemic drugs, I think right now, probably DQ is what we have pending further data. And I think there we do need more drug discovery and identification of newer drugs that are specific for senescent cells without causing toxicities. And that's where a lot of work needs to be done. So you can have kind of local areas in your body, like in the eye or whatever, which has a high senescent burden, but then the rest of the body could be like not have this high, high senescent burden. Um, so I guess, is that true? So the, the senescent burden could be unevenly distributed throughout the body and would have different impacts on different tissues. Yes, I, we're learning more and more that that's the case. I mean, there probably is in a subset of people, a gradual increase in senescent cells across all tissues. And you know those would be the ones that might respond to a senolytic with an overall improvement in multiple functions. But there could be people, for example, you know, in their 60s with Alzheimer's who have high senescent cells in the brain, but not necessarily everywhere else because they have a very specific pathology in the brain that's associated with triggering senescence. So I think senescence can be viewed as something that occurs, you know, perhaps in a substantial proportion of people just with aging but also in association with specific diseases that trigger senescent cells. And these could be, you know, Alzheimer's, uh, uh, atherosclerosis, you know, in certain individuals may be associated with a local increase in senescent cells, certain types of kidney disease, for example. Uh, so, you know, there may be uh, both systemic and tissue specific increases in senescent cells. And again, we have to learn to identify you know, in a given individual, what's going on. Uh, for example, there may be, you know, we could develop protein biomarkers that say, well, this individual based on this blood protein or lipid profile or whatever has an increase in senescent cells across tissues. Another individual could say, well, well, this protein profile suggests that this individual really has mostly an accumulation of senescent cells in the brain. Because the other thing we're learning is that the SAS or the inflammatory phenotype of senescent cells in different tissues is very different. So the senescent cells in the brain could secrete very different inflammatory factors from senescent cells in the blood vessel, for example. So we may be able to identify individuals with high senescent cells in specific organs or tissues. Do you think it would? it's ever going to be possible to rescue senescent cells just i mean i'm just thinking about alzheimer's i mean if you have senescent neurons and all you do is kill them then that that may not be the best option yeah you know i mean i'm not aware in the context of aging of reversing senescence it's always felt to be an irreversible cell fate now there are some recent examples from the cancer field where certain cancer cells may revert to a non-senescent st state. And you know that's been described, but I'm not aware of that in the context of aging. Uh, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that those senescent neurons are really not doing the patient any good. And you know, so killing them may not be the worst thing because they're doing more harm than good because they're secreting the SASP, which is you know, impairing the function of the normal neurons. So by killing those senescent cells, you're gonna improve the function of the remaining neurons and presumably improve overall cognition. Right. Yeah, and since, yes. And, and since the senescent cells are, uh, the SASP is different from the different cells, then hopefully we could get to a point where you could, from a blood draw, you could estimate what kind of cells are senescent and where they are and how much of exactly. them. I mean, you know, and that doesn't seem that far-fetched. I mean, there's recent evidence, for example, not specifically for senescence, but based on blood proteomic analysis, different groups have been able to identify what they call accelerated aging phenotypes in a tissue-specific way. So again, this is not specific for senescence, but more broadly, um, there are biomarkers that potentially identify accelerated brain aging versus accelerated kidney aging 
And so we're already getting, you know, towards that goal.